Hey, good afternoon. This is Bill Gross. I am the host today for our weekly probate mastery community call. We get together every Tuesday, even those that come after our holiday. Tuesday is at noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. And they're recorded and surely posted on YouTube in a nice, pretty edited format. And so we're here to talk about all things probate real estate. I'll share with you for those who don't know me. I took Chad's program three years and two months ago. I've been in real estate a while, but I had to really relaunch from scratch in production. I had no listings, no leads, no buyers, nothing. And really within first year, create a great business, made a lot of money the last couple of years, continue to do. I have a nice pipeline of business right now. And so in my, all my lead generations in the probate space, I took Chad's program in its prior format live a couple of times. Then I took it online as well, probate mastery. And I'm often asked what's the best coaching program for people to get in the business. I tell them that one, it may not get you uh, certified in your state. I'm in California. There's another program that may go through the details of California, but in terms of learning the come from the value proposition you need to create uh, to be successful in real estate, there's nothing better than probate mastery. I participate because I need to keep my head in the game and I need to connect. I think in real estate, whether you're an investor or real estate agent, it's important to connect with people. We're in the meet the people business. And so I come on this call weekly and then Chaz asked me to help co-host it for him from time, this being one of those times. And so the, the format, sometimes we'll have guests that I'll interview. Other times we'll just be question and answer. And it's meant to be a resource for those of you who are building your probate business. We get on today and we can answer questions. You know, there's a coaching program and then we have another program where we charge for one-on-one -on -one coaching, but this is free. If you get on, you want to participate. You can raise your hand like Joyce has in the Zoom app, or you can type a question in the chat box. I'll watch for those questions there and try to get back to them. But it's meant to be participative on the assumption we're all here trying to build our business. We want to work together and be successful. So just before I get to Joyce in the first question, I wanted to share kind of an overview of attorneys. One of the most common questions I get asked is, how do I build a business where I get referrals from attorneys? Who here besides me is interested in building the referral business from attorneys? You put yes in the chat box or raise your hand. By far. So one of the things that's important, I think, for, good, Robert says yes, I see some hands raised. One of the important things to understand is your target or your prospect, to understand them, how they work. And I can go on for hours about this. My father was an attorney. He therefore had colleagues and partners who were attorneys. I went to court with him as a kid. So I kind of grew up in that world a little bit. And I ended up attracting a lot of clients who were attorneys before I was looking for attorney referrals. One thing to share with you is I think there's five basic types of attorneys. When you come across an attorney, you want to put them in one of five buckets and they all kind of get handled differently. And I'll just list the five real quick and I'll describe them. One is a general attorney. Two is a real estate or transactional attorney. Three is a probate administrator. Four is a probate litigator. Siri, Siri always wants to get in on this. And five is a state plan. So one's a general attorney. They're an attorney. They may have nothing to do with any of that. And in general, I would say attorneys tend to be intelligent. They went to law school, they passed the bar. They may or may not be good business people. They may or may not have a lot of common sense, but they tend to be very intelligent. And I think also tend to be powerful people who can refer business. So we've come across an attorney who has nothing to do with probate, but all he does is DUIs or divorces. And of course, divorce is another niche or a bankruptcy or whatever. You'll find that people contact them for business and they will make referrals and those referrals stick. So good to add your COI, and they're also good to ask for referrals to the other types of attorneys that you want to specialize in. Number one. Number two, real estate attorneys. In California, we have a subset of those laws and rules, and we call those people escrow officers. So when, for California, if you hear the word real estate attorney, it really is an escrow officer. In California, we have real estate attorneys that handle big transactions, like commercial transactions, but the routine residential transactions are handled by real estate attorneys in other states. Great sources of business, Great source of referrals for you. They're also a necessary vendor for you. But again, you would identify them separately from the other types of attorneys. The third type is probate administration. This is an attorney who a company goes to, somebody passes, and will hold their hand from the beginning through the end. Typically, they'll follow the probate paperwork, walk them through the process, marshaling the resources, the assets, disposing the assets, and handling it. Now, this is distinctly different commonly from the before probate litigation. Certainly in California, I'm sorry, Vaughn, COI is center of influence. Everybody you know. So if you're Keller Williams, they call them the Mets. Sphere of influence, center of influence. What I would call the people that you know. People you know 
like you and trust you and you like them, trust them. And then, okay, so back. Public litigation is when there's parties who are different. And the problem is that a litigation attorney is a different animal, different species almost than a regular administrative attorney. Often they work in the same firm or they refer business back and forth to each other. But the type of who goes for litigation, the good ones only litigate. The good litigators don't do administration. That's lower paid work for one. It's a different personality style. And so you want to make sure that you find the right niche. And then the fifth is estate planning. These are people who help you avoid probate commonly. They'll set up trusts, wills and trusts. Each state's a little different. And their goal is to help you avoid probate. And they're all different. Now, some cross over primarily estate planners, litigation, administration. But what I find is that each one of these three, I mean, really fits one of those niches really well. And the real good ones know that, and they do one and maybe refer business to somebody else in their firm for one of the others. And so when people say, oh, I need an attorney in Houston, Texas. Oh, I know Joe Smith. He's an attorney. That's like saying, I need a realtor in Houston, Texas. Oh, I know she's a realtor. She might only work with buyers. She might only work with sellers. He or she might only do condos. You might, he or she may, may have done a condo. It might be a new build or builder needs help. Different specialty, commercial, industrial. Just like realtors vary and the best have niches or great at their niche. Same with attorneys. So your goal should be to build a list of attorneys, identify their niches, and when given the chance, you want to make referral that they appreciate and results in business for you. What do I mean by that? My experience is, just to pick a number randomly, if you take a probate case and take it to a probate litigator, they're not interested. And too many times they'll just tell the customer, yeah, I need a $20,000 retainer. I can't help you. And the customer just disappears. And if you don't follow, they'll go to somebody else. If you follow up, they'll say, oh, I called the attorney. He wasn't helpful at all. It's because that attorney really does litigation, doesn't really do probate administration. So you got to make the right connection for your customer, the right connection with the attorney. In my experience, put them together in the old days, walk them by the hand into the attorney's office. These days, they set up a Zoom call and then follow up afterwards with both parties. I follow up with the attorney and the customer to see if it's a good fit. I feel like it's dating and I'm a matchmaker. I never really did that. I'm just making this up. But I feel like that person and I want to follow up. Was it a good match for you? Was it a good match for you? If they're both happy, money. If one's not happy, you have a problem. And so those are the five types of attorneys and make sure you make a referral. You want to get to the right type of attorney. And then you want to make sure that sticks. Sherry says that's helpful. That's just because I said Houston. Sherry, I don't know why I said Houston, but your name popped up there. So maybe that's why. Okay. Questions on that before we go forward. Hey, Winston from Orange County. Any questions on that, the different types, and there's many other types of attorneys. And that's just an overview. But does that help a little bit? Seeing this discussion in several chat, chat rooms, and I want to make sure try to be as pre this group is a great source for referrals. I have a probate a group on Facebook called Probate Experts, try to make, try to build a referral network there. And my goal is to build my own team of real estate professionals nationally. But making those referrals is really important that you get to the right person and then do it in the right way. Okay, that's any questions on that, but I do see Joyce's hand up before your hand gets worn out, Joyce, I'll call on you. How are you doing and how can we help you today? Hi, Bill. I am hoping that you can, you can tell me which direction to go. I have a house that has been vacant for months and the person passed away, the neighbors tell me, and I went on Realist to see if I could find out any information. Mm -hmm. And it does give the, the owner's name and information, but his heirs are, according to the neighbor are in Oregon. Is there any, I don't have any idea whether it's a probate case or anything. Is there any way to to find the heirs. Sure. So, and, and Joyce, where are you located again? In Orange County, California. Oh, see, that's where I grew up. So, and for those who didn't follow that, so Joyce is a real estate agent and she finds a property that's vacant and she looked it up in a service called Realist. So when you're a real estate agent, you plug the MLS and one of the services that come with that as a package is a database of public record data called Realist, R-E-L-S-T. Great source underutilized for research. So she goes on there and finds out the name of the owner and the heirs. So, you know, there are a couple of steps you can take because if the mail, if the mail is to the property address in the old days, that's where the bills went. Nowadays with online, people can go online and have the bill either sent electronically 
and sell it that way or in paperless. So there will be no paper delivered to the house. So, so if that happens, then we no longer have the ability just to track the information of where the bill gets mailed. But you could start with that. I would mail it to the house. Hey, I see the property is vacant. The neighbors have told me that the David Smith, whatever has passed. And I'm an agent in the area specializing in probate real estate. I'd love to help you. I noticed neighbors told me that you're out of state. I'd love to help. You can send to the property address, number one, number two, you can skip tracing and look at that way. The other thing you always should do is check and see if a probate's been filed under that name. If the title's held in the name of the person, then the only way that eventually a probate has to be done at some point. So they have an open probate. What a nice entree that can help you. I know a great probate attorney in Orange County who can help you effectively get the best outcome for your family. I'd love to make an introduction, right? And if you don't have a great probate attorney, Shadi Schaefer is in Orange County. I've interviewed her on my YouTube channel. She's fantastic. We'll do a real good job for you. And then door knocking the neighbors. There might be a neighbor who knows, oh yeah, they live in Portland and they live in this city and work in and track them down that way. So that's where the money is finding is number one, locating the heirs and two, getting into conversation with them. There's, it's not easy. There's no guaranteed answer to it. There are companies that track heirs. If the property is dilapidated or a health issue, then the county's going to get involved. So before it gets to that point, you might want to consider either, you know, contacting the county or doing some research through an heirs research company. Those cost a couple hundred dollars. Depends on the value of the house and, and how much money you want to spend on your business. But I think you're on the right track. I would start with mail. I would try to skip tra trace the address as best I could. Does that help a little bit, Joyce? Yes. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks so much to you. Okay. Next up, let's see. I see hand up D Y three, four, three, nine. Yeah. I got a question to be by the way. How you doing? Great. Who's that? This is David Young here in Atlanta, Georgia. Hey, David. Hot Atlanta. You got it right. Hot Atlanta. Look, my question is, like just said, you put in a, a probate list. You what you, you put in the probate list. You got the mailing address of the executor, but the other address you click on, it says just a, like a senior living address. Do you think that house already been sold if it's Still have, if you have the uh, senior living address on the probate paper, as far as uh, the middle, I mean, the property address. Which service are you using for your data? I get this from the courthouse. So, so his question is, he's going to the courthouse. Are you in Fulton County? Oh, I'm in uh, Fulton County, but I'm putting the list from uh, Cobb County and uh, DeKalb County. Cobb and DeKalb, okay. So two big counties for probate. And the question is, the address is filing the mailing address of the petitioner. Does that mean there's no real estate? Is it, it, you know, if it's filled out by an attorney, it's more likely to fill it correctly. If it's filled out by a pro per or pro se, or the petitioner is not an attorney doing it on their own, they tend to be less accurate. I don't know that you would know. What you might do is take a name of the deceased and do a public record search. Dan, are you a real estate agent? So you might want to pair up with a real estate agent in Atlanta. You're my wife, she's an agent. There you go. You paired up. If you like your real estate agent so much, you're married. Right. <laughs> but be careful about sleeping with your real estate agent. I did the same thing. I married mine too. So you can have her use real S, the same uh, form that uh, Joyce had with the equivalent, but you can look up or whatever other public records you have, but you have the address, you know who the seat in is, you might look up and see if they own any property and that'll give you a clue if there's a house in the status of it. Okay. Appreciate it. Sure. And again, the service, uh, when you go to the county and I don't necessarily know, but there's different forms. So the data we usually buy is usually the mailing address of the petitioner or their last known address where the decedent died, but it may not correspond to property they own. If you put the name of the decedent and you research holdings in their name, it will pop up. Now it might pop up as a trust that tells you that it's not going to work out for you, but if it shows up as a property, odds are that's what's being probated. In, in California, on our petition, you know, the dollar amount they expect to be probated in, in the initial form, they'll give you a clue if there's a house involved. Okay. Do, would you pull your uh, data? Do, do it have, I know it has the middle address, the property address. Do it also have the, the phone number of the executor or the administrator? Well, it depends what you're getting for the data source. So if you're know, in your county, like in LA County, we get the person filing a petition, but usually the attorney puts their number there, not the petitioners. Sometimes the petitioner's name and number and email is there. So it depends. So each county is a little different and each petitioner fills out certain information, these others blank. And then every data source is a little different as well. Some data sources will get the data and then they'll append the data and add in the petitioner's phone number or email if it's available. So again, it depends where you get your data from. If you get it from the county, you're only going to get what's there. But there's data sources, like all the leads as an example, a little more expensive, but they'll take the data cross-reference and pull in the... Yeah, the reason why I asked because uh, 
if I wanted to get some data, I just I was just interested to see what the numbers are already there because the the, because the data that I pull now, I have all the numbers of every number I call is a hundred percent accurate. Nice. Well, then it sounds like you found the keys to the castle, man. Good luck with that. Yeah, appreciate it. Get to work, call him. <laughs> Talk to me. That's a hundred percent accurate every time. Nice, beautiful. Then you got the master list. And now we okay. I saw another hand up. Uh, Winston, but now your hand's down. So you answered your question or you had to leave or something. Uh, uh, what I was going to say, Joyce had a question that in I have some information. I don't know if it's still accurate, but it might help others here in the meeting today. But back in the old days, you could go to the local post office. You had a vacant property, go to the local post office. It would cost a couple of bucks, but they would go ahead and give you the building address. But I don't know if that's true today. Yeah. There's a service, you know, when you do mass mail, that you can have them uh, kick back with the, with the, those addresses. Yeah, I don't know today or not. That's a good one. So you can check your local post office. Also, <clears throat> Joyce, this is Nina. Sometimes if you look in the MLS, MLS is public record info. If it's an absentee owner, sometimes it'll show their actual address. And I have also had luck with when I pull title, sometimes I'll pull documents, deeds, whatever, recordings. And it'll sometimes show the absentee owner's address in there. So that's another sleuthy way of, a few sleuthy ways of finding it. Thank you guys. I appreciate your help. help and if you have the owners, if you have the owner's full name and the city where they, if they previously lived there or the a city that you think they may have lived in, you can even try Los Angeles. There's a service called truepeoplesearch.com and you can do a search for them in there. It's skip tracing where you do it yourself and it'll pull up multiple people with the same name, you know, multiple Joyce's, you know, with the same name and you've kind of got to look to see who it could be. But once you find the address associated with the record, it's pretty good chance that's the right one. And then it's going to have multiple phone numbers, multiple emails, and just like skip tracing, you gotta try all of them. That's okay. another way. Thank you. Very nice. Okay, good. So we got, we got a lot of ways to find the, again, the public record data is really helpful. <clears throat> the realist is the source we use in MLS. And then there's, you know, when your tile company gives you an app, we can pull up public record data as well as the, the documents. And like Nina said, look on the documents for, you know, a stream mailing address. So often there are times just contact info there too. Thank you. Good stuff. Who else has a question, challenge, problem? You don't have a problem. You're not working hard enough. That's for sure. Uh, Jess Hilgenberg is going to Okay, Jess, go ahead. Let's, let's, uh, welcome to our call. Jess, where are you, where are you calling from? I'm actually in Norco, so not far from you. Nice. Yeah. Riverside area. I have a quick question on inventory and appraisal. So okay. when the PR, when they're going pro per and they're doing the inventory and appraisal, how detailed does that have to be in regards to personal property? I've read through the probate code and you can't really find much information. So general consensus, I guess. Are you talking about the inventory and appraisal report that the probate referee does? Yeah, the 160. How, how detailed do you get on, on listing the property that they're to evaluate? Yeah, like as far as the personal property, do they have to list out personal property in the home if there's like art collections or cars or things like that? Well, <clears throat> they're supposed to be accurate. So here's the challenge. Over a certain amount, you know, a probate has to be a full probate versus a limited probate. Mm -hmm. So once you get to a certain point, you know, you have to ask why are you doing the, why are you doing the probate inventory and appraisal report? Let me back up a little bit. Jess is asking about a person representing themselves, a pro that they're not having a training, they're doing it on their own. And they, there's a, in California, we have a form DE 160 that you fill out to order a court approved appraisal called the probate referees report, inventory and appraisal report. On that form, you identify the property that you want them to identify that you want them to evaluate. So if it's property, you put down the assessor's parcel numbers and the legal description and the address. And if there's cars, you list the cars. If there's other material, you have to list it because they have to check it out. So, you know, for example, the reason why is the, the more money coming in, the family gets a value stepped up based on the date of death. And so if the probate referee says it's worth zero and you sell a collection for $100,000, you're going to pay taxes on $100,000 and wouldn't what otherwise wouldn't pay for it. So it's to your advantage to identify as best you can to get as accurate an appraisal as possible. You don't have to obviously um, identify piles of junk of clothes, but things are collect you know, cars for sure, because you have to change title on them. Guns for sure, you change title on those. 
than anything of value that the probate referee can establish a value on. And that gets difficult because, you know, you don't want to bog down and spend time on comic book collection. I'll told might be worth a couple hundred bucks. The other thing to think about is what's the purpose of it? If there's multiple errors and they're all objecting and fighting each other, you know, they're going to want to identify the value of it so that if the executor sells it, they're responsible to split it up. If it's just one error, then it's not such a big issue. But I would say just in general, the more accurate they can be, the better. And there's services that I've used that come in and will inventory everything. They'll take pictures because they're going to sit, want to sell it all. And so that becomes a tool to give the, pro, the um, probate referee, the more information you have to give them, then the more responsible they are to establish a value. So I would definitely, um, if there's enough where it becomes a ministry of problem, that's where you want to call in an estate service. Out of Norco, I use Grayson's or franchise out there. Yeah, that's who I use also. And they, they're gladly to come in and take pictures and give you a, a, a report that you can then take to the probate referee. You don't need to wait for that to sell it. You can sell it anytime you want. That just establishes the value. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So there you go. We have another problem solved today. Who else has a probate problem or business problem? So you've got some questions here. So Melanie's pointing out that for realtors, we have another tool called Remind. You can look up the address and get the owners. You find the absentee owners and contact information. Very good. She's right. Remind, R-E-M-I-N-E is a tool. There's like a free piece of it and then you could pay more for more information. That's a great tool as well. And Terry Hunter asked, the name of the service I use is Grayson. So there's, this is for an estate service, but they'll come in and do an estate sale. It's G-R-A-S-O-N, Grayson's. A company, and I'll put in the chat box. I work with Kelly. She's in the South Bay. There is a franchise, but she'll you know, make the reductions to other places throughout the state. But Grayson's Jerry S O N, as opposed to Nina Grayson, Jerry Y S O N. As great as Nina is, they're not related, as far as I know. No, we're not. But I can tell you, every time I contact Grayson's, they say, "Hey, you know, it's our." Okay, so there you go. I'm repeating that. You're welcome, Terry and Sherry Lynn. I see your hand up. How can we help you today? So I came across a probate lead, a petitioner filed, he, I'm in Houston. And so the personal representative, I'm sorry, the decedent passed away in, I want to say November, early part of November. And it was just filed, just petition was just put in this month in May, earlier in May. And I'm not sure if they've gotten their letters yet or not, but when I was researching the property, it's a reverse mortgage deal. And so I'm not sure in Texas, I'm assuming that the reverse mortgages are pretty consistent across the deal, 180 days, and they're ready to foreclose. And I'm not sure when that, I'm going a lot on assumption here. So that's why I raised my hand, because I'd like to mm. be confident in what I'm doing. That's okay. So I was just wanting to clarify that 180 days started at the day of death, correct? Not uh, when they file? Not when they file. So. What happens is the death certificates now have the social security number on it. It used to not for security reasons, but now what happens is that number is frozen through the banking system. So when the, when that's filed, a uh, notice is sent to social security and then there are banks who subscribe that data and they'll freeze bank accounts, including reverse mortgages, and they'll start their clock really at that time. They could start the date of death, but I, I think they just from a practical point of view, it started from the date they're notified. I was, Used on, to be I was on one of the calls or maybe I was listening to a replay and Chad and his guests were talking about the, sorry, I'm just having a hard time getting my thoughts together. They were talking about how funeral directors are required now to turn that information in. Right. Like to that huge database. And so you wouldn't even need the death certificate for that. I mean, that would already be in process before the death certificates were requested. Well, I mean, these done simultaneously. That's, that's part of the process. They filed the death cert. I think, I think the death certificate data is electronic and gets filed with Social Security Administration. I think it's actually how it happens. And they'll call the Social Security Administration and say, hey, I got a dead one for you. It's all done electronically, I think, now, but the banks get notified right away. So bank accounts get frozen and reverse merge companies subscribe that data and they start the clock. It, it used to be that reverse merge companies would really work with families. My experience was, as a listing agent, I call them up. I show them the listing agreement, you know, MLS, and they would work with you because oftentimes families wait six months for whatever reason. 
Now my experience is they're on the clock and they're going to hit that notice of default, depending on your state, California, going to file notice of default six months to the day. They send a nice letter beforehand saying, well, if you have any questions or problems, please let us know. And then in California, they transfer the loan to a different servicer. And that servicer really is just a law firm that does foreclosure. And they hit the 90 day thing and they hit the notice of trustee sale. And they basically just race to foreclose and it forces you to either sell the property or install them off late. I go, can't speak to Texas, but that's experience. So, so in thinking about the family, right? I mean, I, I, who knows if they even know that mom and dad had a reverse mortgage or whatever. Right. So if they just filed and like when I well, saw the record. Theoretically, they know they're not paying a mortgage. Something's going on. I'm not paying a mortgage. You, you know, how do you assume that happens? Right. Most people, my experience, most people. Okay. They look it up. The first thing they want to know is the house I have worth a half million dollars is free and clear. Or is it half a million dollars? And there's a reverse mortgage on it for half a million dollars. They, my experience is they all know that. So not knowing the family or what their situation is or what they know. Right. How could I contact them? And how would you hold that conversation? Sure. I mean, would you, most... even, would you even say like, I happen to know that you have a reverse mortgage on this property. You know, how deep do you get into the conversation on what you know with them? Sure. And sure, are you a realtor or investor? I'm a brand new realtor. I just got my license last week. Welcome to the team. And what company are you with? Thank you. I'm with Step Stepstone in Houston, Texas. Very nice. Well, welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. So, so, you know, full disclosure, I'm not calling petitioners today. I built my business up where I'm working on attorneys and referrals and investors. I did call petitioners. I have talked to a lot of petitioners. Normally they're referred to me. So I'm coming in with a little bit of referral, a little, a little gravitas, a little juice, right? But that said, if I was starting out, I would call the petitioner. I could to talk to them. And, and if you discovered the property, because it's, is it a probate file? Yes, it was on the public record. So I would just start with that is, you know, I'm a probate real estate agent specialist. I focus on helping families that are in probate get through the process and they notice that you filed a probate, just kind of see how I can help you and just follow the normal process. But if you know that there's a reverse mortgage in the course of the conversation, you might ask the question, I'm just curious, are you aware there's a reverse mortgage? You know, I'd look up the public records. It will show if there's a lien or not and who they are. And usually you can tell if there's a reverse mortgage from that. And I would bring that up and ask them, are they aware of the timing involved in this? And nobody knows the timing because unless you're the lender, you don't know your actual calendar, but we should assume as of the date of death, there's a clock running for six months. I don't know the foreclosure process in Texas. I understand it's faster than California. So I would imagine you got to be really on the, on your ball to, on the ball to move things forward. Now there's different po possibilities. You know, if there's, there's ways that the family can take over the loan in certain circumstances. I interviewed my program on Thursday, the same guy that Chad had on, where there's a yeah. process if it's sold to the FHA and, and that. So you have to learn those kind of, those rules if, that, if applicable. You know, before I would go too far down that rabbit hole, I'd want to talk to them and put it where they are and see who, you know, where, what stage they're in. And is there equity in the property? Because you have to see, is the reverse mortgage filed? And then assuming in the maximum, is there still equity left? If there right. is, you have a game. If there's not, then there's short sales. There's other ways around it as well. Right. But yeah, I would call. And I, I would always refer to why well, I noticed in looking at the public records that I would never say, hey, I know you have a, sh a reverse mortgage. I would say, hey, I, you know, I did look at the public record information. It does show there was a mortgage file in 2019. Are you aware of that? And as long as you present it as, you know, I you know, see this public records, it's different than you know, I'm a creepy realtor who's right. stalking you. Right. right. Does that help? Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you, Bill. Sure. My pleasure. Okay. Winston Covington. No, I was just going to give you uh, give an update on something similar. As to the last caller, as far as what I went, yeah, it's the exception to the really what you were just talking about. But I had a foreclosure referred to me that was reverse mortgage that as of next week, it's been two years since the lady passed away. And it took a lot of work and it took a lot of follow-up and a lot of information, but we were able to negotiate an extension because it was down to the trustee sale time by the time it was referred to me. I had like seven days. But they all agreed with a lot of evidence to back it up. They agreed to extend it out. They actually used it, what they call a COVID exemption to give me the foreclosure. So it can be done. It just takes a lot of work. I think it's harder in Orange County where you want 
in LA County, I would say again, extensions is almost a rule if you ask the judge for it. And the judge can absolutely prevent, a judge in probate court in LA County can absolutely prevent a foreclosure. In Orange County, the, ju the judges, I think, are more by the book and will say, hey, you had six months. Why should we bother the lender over to county and obviously state? But thanks for sharing the, the rest of the story with us, Winston. Appreciate that. Yeah, no, this one was actually in Riverside County. It was going to be, I ate up the sleeve, but we were able to negotiate it without having to go to court and have the, the judge put that on hold. But good job, man. Yeah, it can be done. Chuck, thanks so much. Thanks for sharing that. Can I put in the chat box, uh, by the way, the link to an interview with Jason Eichmiller? He's a reverse mortgage specialist that Chad interviewed. Um, I also interviewed him as well last week. Fantastic guy. Great interview. Definitely worth watching and participating. Okay, next up, I see a hand up, Derek Wallace. Welcome, Derek. How can we help you? I had a, a question. I, had, I have a, a client that is interested in purchasing the home. It is, they're interested in purchasing the home that is their, their father's that pay. So they're, they're, what they're wanting to do is not have to go through the probate process and it gets separated between their, her brothers. The probably needs a lot of work. I just wonder, would they have to go through the process in order to be able to, to purchase a home or should, or would they be able to do that beforehand? And so is the, well, first off, what state are we talking about? Where's the property? Okay. So I don't know North Carolina law specifically, though I did interview a couple of attorneys from North Carolina recently on my YouTube channel. What I'll say is generally, I think the laws are the same there. You have a property that's deeded in the name of the fathers. Unless it's deeded differently, only the father can sell the property, right? Father owns it. So you have to do something to change the title. Either the deed that it's in provides for it. There's certain deeds in North Carolina that will allow upon death to transfer. But if it's a standard deed, not, that's what probate does, will change the, the court has to approve changing the title of property from deceased father to where is the rightful heirs. The challenge then is if there's multiple heirs, and there's a fraction of the, they each have a fractional interest, what happens? And there, you know, it again, varies based on the law. Sometimes one can, has to buy out the others with cash. Oftentimes you have one who just wants to sit there for free. He's living in the house for free or she, and they don't want to sell the house, but they don't want to pay rent either. Well, that's a nice deal, but eventually the heirs can force a sale. So I would say definitely talk to an attorney in North Carolina that can help you. And also, are you a investor? It sounds like. Or well, I'm a real estate agent. Yes, sir. Oh, you are. Okay. So I would definitely say find what a good excuse to find a real estate, I mean, a, a probate attorney in North Carolina and find one that will give you some advice as to what can be done and uh, what can't be done as far as those. I'm, I'm looking, I know I interviewed an attorney in North Carolina. Uh, they were great. Where are they? Here, uh, but, 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 you'll have to look for it. Um, so bad, my own, my own YouTube channel, I can't find who I want to talk to, but definitely would talk to an attorney in North Carolina and give you the specific answer of what has to be done for the family and they want to protect their interests. If it's multiple heirs, there's three or four siblings, they're all probably entitled to a third or fourth each, then probably have to sell the property. There's no way around it, but definitely we'll look into that. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Derek. Hand up. I see Nina. Hey, Bill. I was going to actually make a comment on the heck I'm based on my current experience. And also it ties into with attorneys, which I've had a few calling me, which is nice in them. But this current listing I have is with a friend of mine, actually an investor who I am her California realtor. She works with me here. She lives in Georgia, sold a few properties for her and her family. And so she's, you know, like, yeah, you're listing it. She's committed. And I've presented a very specific strategy to increase the value of the home with renovations, which of course takes a little bit more time and it does have a heckum. And so to get in front of it, I said, go ahead and send out your letter mail to the servicer because one, these servicers are hard to reach for heckums. And just you know that is one of the biggest ones and being a big hard to reach. And two, I wanted her to get a little extra time to ensure we had enough time for our renovation plus the listing period to get it sold without needing to rush to get an extension. And so we did that. And then she's always going back to her attorney and checking in. And I said, oh, and I tell her, always check with your attorney. And when we initially talked, she sa I said, well, what do you want to do with the property? She said, well, her brother, he wants to keep it. He want it was his, he grew up there. I said, okay, well, if he wants to do that, he's going to have to do a buyout and I explain that process. You know, my, my fiduciary responsibility is to the best is to my client and to ensure that they're going to achieve their best interest. Right. 
So I wasn't trying to get the listing. I was really trying to ask, you know, answer for questions. And then I said, here's how you could increase the profit. Or if you sell it as is, this is how much it will sell for, you know, all of the litany. And so the attorney, she shared with me what the attorney said. And mind you, we're friends. My, my client and I are friends. And so she's just going to share everything for that close. And she said, oh, she's just wanting the commissions. Oh, you, you know, she's painting such a rosy picture for the renovation. Oh, don't worry about this heck and we've got six months. Let's just get it sold. Don't worry about an extension. And I know how I heard that in terms of, and this is true, you know, and I'm not knocking the attorney, very good attorney does a lot of probates in California. Well, my point is that, you know, attorneys have to advise their clients and they're trying to give the PR an understanding of be objective and really listen to what this you're being advised by this agent who's saying what you can and can't do with the listing, you know, they're saying that. And, you know, it comes out of their mouth sometimes. Oh, they, all they care about is getting the listing and the commissions, which my friend knows that's not what it's about or at all. And yet she said all of this, but more importantly, she didn't seem to, she's LA County and she didn't seem to see the value or the urgency of getting in front of the heck, especially when we were already delayed over 30 days with the court date because the half brother filed a competing petition, which he then, he then basically said, okay, yeah, you could do it. You can be PR. So my point is that there, there is some degree of protection that the attorney is taking with their client, even if you are also another advisor and there's an important piece of ensuring communication between you and the attorney. And I referred my client, my friend to this attorney, because she's done so many pieces and she actually worked with the previous client, client of mine. And yet I've asked her for a consultation, a conversation, and the attorney's just pushing back, not wanting. And I have a feeling it's because she kind of put her foot in her mouth. But Bill, what do you have to say to some of those pieces I mentioned around how, how you kind of have to navigate working with attorneys who may otherwise tend to, you know, not necessarily paint you in the greatest light, but risking the you're attempting to risk your business, but more importantly, kind of doing the opposite of how you yourself have advised the client. Well, so to go back to the beginning, when I talked about, thanks, you know, thanks for the question. In general, the client talking to an attorney that I didn't refer them to, I don't think in general is good for them. I think I know more than most attorneys do. I don't know the law better. I know more about probate real estate than they do, with all respect. And so I think that I assume that when they talk to somebody else, they're going to get information that's probably incorrect. Though I might, you know, you and I would disagree. And I might probably also disagree with Chad. You and Chad both are more likely to encourage an estate to improve a property. My experience is 95% of people really aren't able to do that. And I would throw it out in passing, but I would really try to discourage them on that one. And so I think that when you kind of let people go that path, you're open to criticism. And, and, and I would say maybe, again, respectfully fair criticism. But in general, I, I just find the attorneys are generally, even the successful ones are not great business people. They might be great attorneys. They might really know the law and how to do probate, but they don't necessarily know how to build relationships with their clients or relationships with vendors like you or me. And so I always assume it's bad. That's why I refer them to somebody that I can add value in that relationship for my customer. And then as a result, I'm now referring to an attorney who is more likely to work with me because when they go to an attorney that I'm not referring to, that attorney is going to try to pull them from me to somebody else. That's just how it works. And that's so, actually what it felt like was happening. Of course. Oh, I of course that's what's her. happening. That is what's happening. Well, no, so, but, the, but the thing is I referred the, my client to this attorney. That was my point at the very beginning. And I'm not, <laughs> most of them don't know how to accept referrals. Right. And, and that's just, so another friend of mine, another colleague, he's like, oh, she was probably has her go-to agent that she gets a kickback from. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe it's their spouse or daughter. Maybe not. Okay. Yeah. And, and I would say some of them are set up that way. And half of them are just, in my experience, such poor business people. Exactly. If they're just negative, you know, they're people who, attorneys by their nature can be very nitpicky and negative about everything. You know, if you want an email, you know, edit it, send it to an attorney, they'll find every little mistake and error. And that's great. But my experience is, you know, when a customer talks to an attorney, the attorneys will give them 10 things to be worried about. And if you really followed everything an attorney worried you about, you'd never invest in anything. 
And I'm not saying, therefore, don't listen to attorneys. Don't be surprised when attorneys try to talk customers out of business. And I, I think that's a problem. That's why I work hard to refer them to people I would work with. But I will say this. My first, I took chess program three years ago, two months, or three years ago, three months ago, three years and three months ago. My first year, I didn't get any business from referring business to attorneys. I, I referred them plenty of leads and got nothing back at all. Zip. Shocking. I'd work with trades my whole career. Shocking. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so, it, it, and now, since then, I've learned how to work with them more effectively. And I've learned their limits. And I've learned they often don't look at their business like a business. But they, you know, artisans who are attorneys as opposed to business people. So you have to, have to understand that going in and work the relationships appropriately for that. And look, I've, I have a number of trades I've done a lot for who I don't get anything from. That's just the nature of the beast. But, you know, I do believe this. If you take care of the customer, in the long run, it comes back to you from somewhere and I don't really worry about it. Mm -hmm. But I would say you don't expect it back from the attorney. Don't be surprised if they undermine the business, even to their own. Again, though, I will say in this case, when you tell somebody to approve a property and in California, that's out there. Well, the heck, that's out there. I think you need to look at that one yourself and say, you know, that's most people just aren't set up to handle doing the home improvement. Most people just don't have the skill set and the temperament to do it. And I, I think it, you made it, I think you made it easy for the trade to create. Well, actually this particular, my friend is an investor. So she's okay. done, she does flip. She's doing a new, new instruction right now. And she does because when she interviewed with her, I told her what she doesn't mean to pay attention. Yeah. And then, well, yeah, I provided a very detailed strategy to the attorney. Doesn't mean to pay attention. Upon request. And she's like, I don't think she ever read the email. So yeah, it does surprise me. I, that is very revealing because I don't, do, I write, my business is focusing on PRs. Eventually I'll probably, I may not even really work with attorneys for referrals just because I'll have my law degree by then. But right now I am working with PRs and I can say, yeah. I think it's definitely, you, you, I think you hit the nail on the head. Their mindset is very much about the practice and business they're running. Everybody is. Let's, let's, let's be honest. Most realtors are running a real estate job, not a business. Most investors are investing in a deal, but they're not building a business. We all are guilty to some degree. And we're just seeing it in somebody else because it affects us. So, okay. Hey, Derek, I see you got that, but just for everybody else on the call, I did an interview with a great attorney in North Carolina, Jason Walls, Walls Love, and they do probate litigation, probate administration. They also do, again, he has multiple attorneys. And I also interviewed a CPA and it's from a the state administration. So good pressure for you to meet. You might want to see if you can get in there and meet them. If you have a client to bring to them, obviously they're going to be all ears on how to do business with you. So thanks. Thanks, Nina. Thank you, Derek, as well. Okay, we're wrapping up here. I'm starting kind of a few minutes left. Last question. Anybody have burning desire? Raise your hand or put it in the chat box. I think I covered everything else that's in the chat box up until now. Yeah, and one of the morals of the story is watch the past episodes of this call. And then particularly the interviews that Chad does. He does a really good job. And I thought Jason was a really good one in, in general. Any other questions? And also, Rylas Dana was a turn to the interview. I interviewed as well, Rylas. Really great guy. Any other questions, challenges, problems? You guys all have more business you know what to deal with, more leads than you can handle? Okay, well, we'll finish up here. So look, uh, thank you for being on the call today. Thanks for those who participated and had questions. As I always say to you, the more you participate, the more you make, the more you give, the more you get. That's just how life works. It's not my rule. That's just how life is set up. So thanks for those who participated. I'm Bill Gross. I was the guest host today for Chad Corbett's Probate Mastery. We do this every Tuesday at 12 noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. It's recorded. It will be on his website, on the Probate Mastery website, as well as a YouTube channel. So feel free to check that out. And also in the Probate Mastery group inside Facebook, a great place for networking, asking questions, and getting help as well. So if I can help at all, I'm Bill Gross. You can reach out to me in social media. I'm Bill Gross. I'm at Bill Gross EXP. It's my YouTube channel, my Facebook, and my LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out. If I can help, Karen, I'm glad you learned a lot. Thank you for being on the call. Thank you to everybody being on the call today. Look forward to seeing you next week. Make it a great week, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you.